everyone, welcome to Constructed Chaos. Today, I have a bit of a confession to make in that I waited until the last minute to start on some new terrain for tomorrow's session. So without much time to spare, I'm gonna show you how to make this rock terrain as fast as possible, even if you waited until the day before to start on it. There are a few things I wanted to keep in mind during the process of this build. First, of course, I want it to look good. Two, I want it to be modular and versatile so that I can use it in a variety of environments. And three, I want it to be highly playable so that it adds something to encounters and isn't just pretty background scenery. We'll be shaping about half of this project out of foam, but admittedly, I did manage to squeeze in a couple of 3D prints from printable scenery as well. I figured this could be a good opportunity to showcase the two strategies side by side and weigh the benefits of each against one another. But before we get to the 3D print stuff, we'll start by making some shapes out of some polystyrene foam from the hardware store. You'll see that I'm using some one inch foam here, but feel free to use something longer. I just happen to be unlucky enough to live in an area where this is all I can get. For something like this, thin foam can be just as good. The idea is to create pieces that can stack on top of each other and create new elevations every time I use them. Making permanently bonded structures definitely looks better, but I think versatility should take the lead here. Now that our shapes are drawn, I'll be using my Proxon hot wire tool to cut them out. You can just as easily use a sharp knife to do this if you don't have access to something like the Proxon. Just be careful not to cut yourself. That's my disclaimer, so you can't come after me in the comments when you notice a small cut on my hand later in the video. As you cut these out, don't stress too much with following your drawn shapes to the letter. We'll be ripping these to shreds with a knife in a moment anyway. Once everything's cut out, we'll take our knife and begin scoring the sides all the way around each piece. Try not to think too much about every little cut or you'll be doing this forever. And keep an eye for any edges where you might be able to notch out a change in elevation on the piece itself. It's not necessary, but it can definitely add to the playability of the piece. Now here is where a lot of people might disagree with my methods. I've seen countless videos that recommend using flocking on top of your rocks or adding texture with sculpt -a mold but we don't have time for that today. You'll see me just use my knife to cut scores into each piece. I'm not going very deep with this and I'm careful not to make the cuts too uniform, but I do find that this can actually make a more believable rock surface if done correctly. With our pieces all chopped up, we're almost done with this foam. Almost. Do prepare yourself for quite a mess. These little foam bits get everywhere. Did I mention I hate the color pink? Well, it's time to cover that up with some Mod Podge mixed with black paint. This classic mixture is a staple in a ton of foam-based crafting videos. So you may have seen this before. Basically, it helps to make sure your foam is nice and durable. I do have just enough time to let this cure overnight, but if you're in even more of a rush than I am, you can also harden your foam using a heat gun. Just be sure to wear a mask with a good filter and work in a well-ventilated area if you choose to do that. Once that Mod Podge layer is completely cured, our foam pieces are officially caught up with our printed terrain. So from here, I'll mostly just dictate steps for both in tandem. But it is worth noting that while both took the same amount of time to get to this point, the 3D printing I did with my Prusa happened while I was sleeping and working on other things. For me, the trade-off of time versus the cost of filament and the 3D printer itself is absolutely worth it, but that might not be the case for everyone. Anyway, we'll begin our paint job for all these pieces with my favorite base color for rock and stone. It's called Wrought Iron from Folk Art. You can really use any dark gray at this point, but I really like that this one has a bit of green tint built into it. In particular, you'll want to make sure that you get this into every nook and cranny on the piece, especially any spots on the foam terrain where the pink might be showing through. Once these base coats are done, you may want to add some undercoats of vibrant yellows, reds, or greens. This can add a lot of depth to your rocks, even if you don't see much of these colors in the finished product. However, I'm running out of time, so I'll be skipping that step. Instead, I'll water down some brown paint and make a sort of wash out of it. Using that, I paint the brown into the crevices and dips of the piece where dirt might pile up. You don't have to be too careful with this step, so long as you have a paper towel nearby to wipe off the excess. Just be warned, paint will get everywhere during this step. 
Once that has ample time to dry, we'll jump over to our main coat of paint. You'll want to do a fairly wet, dry brushing of a medium gray color. I'm using French gray specifically because it's the only thing that I had on hand. No time for a trip to the hobby store today. Just make sure that you're not painting too much into the crevices. You want to conserve some of that brown and dark gray so that there's good depth on the piece. I did find that for this layer of paint, the best strategy was to go from side to side and not as much up and down. This helps to imitate the striations found in rocks as some sections of the brush strokes show through. And here, <laughs> I would just like to take a moment and admire the work we've done so far. Finally, our rock terrain is starting to look a bit more like rocks. Give yourself a pat on the back for making it this far. And if you haven't already, like the video. I'd really appreciate it. For our last step, we'll do one final lighter dry brushing. Make sure you get most of the paint off of your brush before you apply it so you don't overdo it and ruin your paint job. I find it best to start brushing very, very lightly and slowly add more pressure to the brush as I feel like I want more paint to be applied. Unlike the last coat, I like to brush from top to bottom so that it imitates the light hitting the rocks and revealing the very edges of jagged details. And after all that, we are left with an assortment of highly flexible terrain that can be used in almost any environment. Obviously, you can use these to create expansive mountain terrain with tons of unique playable surfaces and possibilities. But because we kept these relatively simple, they can also be used in conjunction with desert terrain, snowy tundra, forest elevations, and even little islands and obstacles for encounters on the open sea. You can also form little caverns and cave entrances to hide a surprise or two for your adventuring party as they navigate through the scene. If you'd like some other examples for uses of this mountainous terrain, please check out our Twitch channel or take a look at some of the VODs we have here on YouTube where we actually use the terrain in live play sessions. These might not be the most realistic looking rocks, but a lot can be said about the simplicity and versatility of them. Even still, I may eventually do another video where I elaborate on some of these concepts and show you how to tie them into more specific biomes using things like flocking and grass tufts and the like. If that's something you'd be interested in seeing, please let me know down in the comments. And if you're enjoying the content so far, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and rock the like button. And until next time, go out there and make some chaos.